to the next uh, event in this session, which is the round table with Martin House and Ivo Loro, where they, they propose towards a new theory of becoming geological. Uh, so questioning the rendering of experiential environmental change and exchange through the anthropogenic with a particular focus on interactions between particulate matter and environmental conditions. Um, give me just a second. Okay, Yves Loro has a master in environmental engineering. He's a PhD researcher in history of science and technology, while also concluding a second master in sound production and technology here at Lusofna. His interests focus on sound and listening as epistemological tools in traditional and techno-scientific settings, as well on how humans and non-humans relate to their environment through the sonic experience. His artistic practice focuses on experiencing ecological problems through data sonification. And Martin House is occupied with a very interesting investigation of the links between the earth, geological and geophysical phenomena, software, and the uh, a-human or human psyche, psychogeophysics, through the construction of experimental situations, performances, laboratories, walks, workshops, material artworks, instruments, fictions, texts, and software. He's also the creator of the ongoing ERD modular synthesizer series and the founder of the tiny mining community. So thank you, Martin. Thank you, Ivo. Thank you. Thank you. So, <coughs> so should we start? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you so much. I, I, I'll 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 start and I'll I'll challenge it a little bit, uh, Martin. I'll try as much as I can. But I think that uh, this uh, I didn't know that how well this. Uh, um, this session was uh, was organized. I think it's awesome that we have uh, a scientist that deals with turbulence, uh, a visual a, a researcher uh, that deals with uh, objectivity, uh, and Jamie Pereira, who also works with data sonification. I think it's very interesting because uh, ties very strongly with my my re, my own research uh, on atmospheric uh, acoustomology, so ways of knowing through sound what hap what's happening in the atmosphere, but also um, uh, 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 feeling and getting a, a, an aesthetic experience out of it. So the point where uh, reasoning in knowledge production meets also the, the the aesthetic experience uh, and the connection also to places. Uh, so that's just a, a, an aside. Uh, what what I what I have here behind us it's a, a video that we that uh, we made of uh, Martin House's workshop. Uh, uh, Martin House on a Monday. He did a workshop where he built, where we built some sensors, but also where we explored ways of uh, sensing and hearing and visualizing uh, radioactive and particle particle emissions. And this is a radioactive rock that Martin uh, lunges around. So I don't know if he has it with him today, but he he, he walks around with a box of radioactive rocks. And he put this, and we did this experiment where we could see the, um, the radioactive particles uh, interacting with, a, with a, a cloud of ethanol and making it uh, uh, condensate. So it produced this wonderful uh, cloud uh, full of turbulence, if we see, if you want to see it. Uh, and one question that I, I asked 
for Martin, and I think he, he works a lot. He works a lot with. Uh, I think he's an hazard uh, artist. <laughs> he works a lot with with dirty materials. Uh, not as I said. No, no, I don't mean anything to this. It's just the materials that he works with are very, very. Uh, in some way, they are they are dangerous. Although it's more a question of how much time you spend with it. Uh, and my, my but my question started to be because Martin does a lot of this kind of um, uh, workshops and exhibitions and, and, and practices where he showcases uh, what's happening uh, beneath what we can see. And uh, I asked him why, why is it important for us to, why is it important for you to show us uh, uh, what's happening? Try and answer in a roundabout way, which is also something that we, <coughs> yeah, excuse me, that we also discussed yesterday. Was that somehow what I'm interested in is like extending. It's not necessarily about this rendering visible of something which is invisible, but really gaining an understanding of what I describe as these like energetic phenomena, which surround us of things which are considered to be non-living, as in geological beings. Let's say that these are also involved in exchanges of energy in cycles that our bodies are also involved in. So it's really about this extension of being able to see these interactions of particles to the understanding that these interactions are also going on with the human body. Like, so for example, when we're standing around the cloud chamber with the radioactive rocks inside the cloud chamber, this is not just something that we're observing. Well, we are observing this at a distance, but at the same time, there is no separation between us and those phenomena our bodies at the same time that we're observing these particles these particles are interacting with our bodies in unseen ways and we also talked about this yesterday about how i'm kind of quite interested in this concept of that we become ourselves like indicators of anthropogenic change or geological change these two things are kind of intertwined i mean kind of the kind of classic example of the I was going to say the cat in the canary, but it's not the cat in the canary, it's the, <laughs> the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. So this kind of like how, or we can look at, for example, studies of plants and the uptake of radioactive materials at Chernobyl or something like this. So the plants are kind of seen as sensors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in this kind of very abstract way. Oh, we have these plants which are sensors, but what happens if we start eating these plants or if other animals are eating these plants, like this becomes, we're also becoming these kind of sensors so I'm kind of interested in how this kind of experience of the Anthropocene, which I have problems with, is not something which is at a distance. Mm -hmm. And this is something which I will say now, not so much as a provocation, but that's the problem I have to some extent with this idea of data, which is recorded from anthropogenic interventions within the environment. It's something, I don't like the idea that it's always something which is observed and becomes the problem I have with the Anthropocene, okay, we go off the subject or not, is that it is something which is spectacular and is still within the realm of a spectacle for humans to not necessarily enjoy, but to enjoy or to lament or to uh, have an emotional... Mm -hmm. There is yeah, a, a... Like it's an achievement in a sense to have mm -hmm. arrived at this Anthropocene as like somehow it might be a negative achievement, but mm -hmm. and this is something which I kind of... There is a sublime of the Anthropocene. Yeah, yeah which I try to, I mean, here, well, obviously, we have a large screen. I mean, this is not, I mean, these are not anthropogenic materials. These are, so basically, the rock that we see large here, very large, is collected from waste heaps, from uranium mining uh, operations in southern Germany. So, this I collected myself. So, I go with people I was working with at the time with big Geiger counters and we search for the most active minerals, but these happen to be on a large pile of rocks very close to a small village. So this is something which has been there for mm, 40 years, 50 years, or something like this, I guess. So this is something which is part of the environment. So this is just to provide a context of that these, the rocks that we observe as some kind of scientific phenomena are really part of our environment. They just happen to have been, I mean, they're naturally occurring. Mm -hmm but they just happened to have been, well, for various reasons, like geopolitical reasons, they were dug up and left exposed now mm -hmm. to the point where they're not really safe, mm -hmm. I guess. But that's another question of like, mm -hmm. which is also my, 
more current interest. But it's like how human health, what is the relation between geology and human health and how this has kind of changed over time or between different cultures. Mm -hmm. Yes, that leads you into your more um, early modern, pre-modern pre uh, epistemologies of uh, natural magic and uh, alchemy. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's also interesting because that relates very well to your um, the way that you see that these things are, that, that you see and know and you show that these things are not inert. Mm -hmm. Inert matter; they are uh, they are in constant uh, exchange and, and becoming. Mm -hmm. But uh, you also talked about this new theory of uh, becoming geological, uh, and I, I, I also asked you, oh, but in what sense are we mm, becoming differently geological from what we already are? Okay, I mean, I was, like, if I briefly describe a bit the kind of, the, how to say it, like the genesis of this idea of becoming geological, which is obviously yeah, yeah. an idea which is not sure, unique sure. to me, but I started to phrase it as becoming geological. So this came from the tiny mining project, which was already mentioned, which was a project which I was involved in at the beginning. So it's a community of people that wish to extract some kind of meaningful resources from within their own bodies. So this could be certain metals, precious metals, elements which could be useful or have some, yeah, some symbolic connection to whoever's doing the extraction. So it became a kind of aesthetic, rather than aesthetic, well, it's also aesthetic, practice of undergoing certain diets which might be rich in certain elements and then practicing further diets of then allowing those elements to be pulled out of the human body um, and also the development of pharmaceutical products to do this as well as a kind of reflection on one's dreams, daily practices involving these metals or elements. So this kind of led to this becoming geological, which was the idea that not only are we with this kind of Anthropocene changing geology or becoming part of the geology by putting ourselves out there and having this spectacle, but we're also inhaling and ingesting our own geological markers. Mm -hmm. So we ingest anthropogenic particles or breathe in anthropogenic particles, ingest products which are contaminated with mining residues, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's more about that it's less that it's something which is static, but more that it's becoming geological, is becoming embedded within cycles which might be considered mm -hmm. geological. Yeah. Uh -huh. And also learning from this, like learning from the idea of what it could be to become geological, to kind of think about our relationship with the environment. So developing a different kind of awareness through diet and through reflection. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that is interesting because you actually put your body to the test with, <laughs> with that uh, 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 practice of awareness. And awareness, I think it's also a, a, a main topic on all the works that have been uh, presented, or, or at least are presented around, for instance, um, Sonification of environmental problems, as we saw with uh, Jamie Pereira's, he, he looks at uh, how uh, these works of sonification can lead you to aware awareness of hope. I think it was something like that. Um, but uh, in your case, your awareness is it more of a phenomenological awareness for us to be really aware of. At, and attuned to our environments, or do you also want to have a, a kind of a, a activist uh, impact, kind of a, 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 an influence on how how people then uh, themselves uh, uh, relate to these environmental problems? Well, I think it's a difficult <laughs> question, which one always struggles with. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And my work, I mean, I would say that this kind of somehow, my work is not about an awareness which comes maybe from, I keep on saying from a distance, but I think through this new way of becoming geological, there could potentially be a new imaginary or a new way of thinking about our relationship with the world, which might be completely other to how we think about mm -hmm. things now. And I'm not so hopeful that we can 
if there is a question of solving, which I don't know if there is a question of solving the problems which we ourselves have created, but there is maybe another way through, which may be negative, positive, whatever those things mean for whoever mm -hmm. they mean, um, but another way of considering one's life and one's death within the world, I think, okay. is kind of provided by, so for example, like it's a lot of all the research which I conduct now as part of the tiny mining project is looking a lot at Chinese, well, early Chinese alchemy, which is kind of, I mean, I can talk forever about this, which I know nothing <laughs> about, but, but basically there was kind of considered more or less two forms of alchemy, that were, but both of them in contrast to kind of Western alchemy, which was somehow concerned with the body, but also concerned with materiality and the production of certain metals. Mm -hmm. But Chinese alchemy is concerned with the body, even in the inward and the outward aspects. So this idea of the body becoming some kind of laboratory in terms of inner alchemy that is, I mean, talking of like purifying or something like this, but that it really is something which is kind of like studied and working from a very interior understanding, mm -hmm. I think. So it's nothing to do with really wealth or prosperity or material things, but it's somehow very, yeah, I think it's kind of interesting to think of these kind of aesthetic practices, you know. Um, so for example, on one side of things, there would be monks who would practice a certain uh, a diet towards the end of their lives to literally become geological. So they would at some point merge into their environment through practicing this very special diet that would actually preserve their, their body in a state that was uh, mm -hmm. kind of eternal somehow. Mm. Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was kind of, it's interesting to think about this, these kind of quite, I mean, they might appear quite extreme ways of considering one's life in the world as, so that's a kind of, yeah. I mean, that is some kind of activism, but it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's another imaginary, let's say. Mm -hmm. Well, I, s I still feel that uh, to actually uh, be present, be um, to actually be, be in the presence of the the, the phenomenon, like we were mm -hmm. with this cloud, does does have a, a, a does change completely our ways of seeing. For me, it was just a rock before <laughs> oh, before oh. It, it was, and it this also leads me to modes, modalities of uh, uh, showing that, that becoming of geo ge mm -hmm. geological, because you don't have a, a specific modality that you want to, to work with. You, you work with visuality, but also mm -hmm. work with, with, with sound mm -hmm. uh, and performance. Mm -hmm. uh, and and um, I, I, I do, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, for instance, and this relates a lot with the Jamie Pereira's talk about how uh, sound is maybe more emotional. The data is just hard facts, mm -hmm. this uh, uh, cold data, and sound uh, makes things more emotional. But uh, there is a, a, a critique among uh, sound studies uh, and among some researchers that have looked into sonification, that is the, this, this idea that um, there is some kind of, uh, in a sense there is a, and, uh, and this also a little bit to challenge Jamie, um, there is also a kind of a, a, a colonial essentialist language around sounds that makes it more emotional than vision. It's not that vision is not emotional, it's just as, has been constructed with, as a uh, 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 the objectifying sense through like 400 years of uh, scientific practices and colonial practices. Uh, I, 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 I would like to ask you about your own modalities of, of showcasing. Do you have a, does it matter to you to present it in a particular way over another? How do you feel that they themselves um, 
show different aspects of the the the, the phenomena, of of the geology oh, also oh. of the, the phenomena. I, I mean, I think it's. I mean, obviously, it's impossible to avoid some kind of aesthetic decisions in whatever one does. But I try. I don't know. Like I'm always for me, what's interesting is to kind of how to say not to say again to repeat like to reduce the distance so there's nothing so much which is obviously there will always be some mediation but for me it's like if like if I view like if I work for example with electronic or scientific devices I try to kind of break them open so that whatever the phom phenomena that is being observed or is expected to be observed becomes part of that device so the device somehow is taken over or parasited by the ob observed thing I guess. Mm -hmm. So for example, like if I, like I was working at one period a lot with mushroom mycelium, mm -hmm. and I really, and electronic device, and I really wanted the mushroom to become part of, to take over the electronics and to steer it in its own living kind of course. And just an example, which is kind of trivial, but within the kind of question of aesthetics. So for one work, which was shown in Taipei with Shuli Chung and Franz Ava and Taro, so this kind of um, mycelial collective, mycelial network collective that we formed, and we, I was responsible for this kind of like radio mediation, or the mycelium would kind of somehow forge its own kind of like radio transmissions, and then during this, which would be audible through people having radio receivers around, but I had no control over the sound. Mm -hmm. Like it was not, I constructed these devices, so I have some control, and then somebody asked me during the exhibition that why were the mushrooms not sounding beautiful? Because they were very noisy <laughs> and harsh. And I don't mean to say it to like, you know, raise a question to that person, but it's just kind of like, that also made me think that, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then again, maybe I do also have my own aesthetic of, you know, I did not, yeah, for me, they sounded quite beautiful, this noise that they were, that was always changing and was quite turbulent and chaotic, but. Yeah, exactly. So there's like, obviously, a, mm, an aesthetic and a mediation decision there because you could have just plugged those electrical signals oh. into a, another digital uh, uh, analog interface oh. and just put it into a, uh, a MIDI piano and oh. let it oh. play sure. a, a, nice a, 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 a pentatonic <laughs> scale. Oh. But you decided that no, just this just goes in directly into yeah. the, I mean, the, tried, the amplifier. Yeah, I just tried more or less to to, to, to strip down whatever <laughs> this radio transmitter was that was working with the mushroom to like the bare minimum. So it was really, and in an ideal situation, the mushroom would be everything. You know, there mm -hmm. would be. You know, it's kind of like, how much can I take away and leave with the mushroom or the mycelium? Mm -hmm. but Did the mushroom listen back? Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Do you believe so? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's important. I mean, at the same time, it's also informed by the vibration. Exactly, exactly. That's that, so. There's been experiments with plants mm -hmm. with that, you know, feedback, biofeedback of mm -hmm. uh, uh, plants with uh, the sounds the, of sonification of their own uh, electrical currents and then mm -hmm. feeding back the sounds and see if it changes. Some people say that it actually. It does. I was wondering if it happens with uh, the mycelium. So. <laughs> but then I don't. Yeah, I don't really think of it as sonification because it's yeah. more that it's more that they like the way I think of it is that they are taking part in the material process, which I have. Mm -hmm. I'm also taking part in, and the people in the space are also taking part in because the movement will affect mm -hmm. the radio waves. So it's kind of a whole. So it's, it's just setting up a situation that those things can occur in that. An ecological system, a yeah. situated ecological system yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think if anybody has questions. <laughs> yeah, lots of questions. <laughs> now, just a, a comment again. Um, so I think in uh, all the talks there was an underlying uh, underlined theme that was maybe Jamie mentioned it, but it wasn't really specified, which is that of like surpassing duality, and that's why somehow I was uh, mentioning uh, Indian philosophy in the sense that it's, it's all based also on the idea that there is no duality, whereas uh, in uh, um, 
in a Western culture and vision dominated culture and dominating culture, there is always the idea of uh, um, self and other and the idea of otherness that's informing all the all the critique or you know the dialectic of uh, the, even the triangulation starts from from self other and then and then the, the the extra element and in that I would see somehow also I mean this is obviously my interpretation that Martin can um, you know object. Um, but I think becoming geological is a form of like um, it's a, a way, for example, of what well, uh, this um, indigenous language that was like being a Saturday or being a river uh, is uh, feeling rather than seeing. And in, in, in this also, sound is not just sonification, sound is, is something that does not divide in a sense, it unites rather than, and it's, it, it has to do with feeling, because it's not just hearing, it's, it's, it's a form of perception that um, it, it, the, the, it's, the vibration is, is a physical uh, uh, contact through the, something that you, you, you perceive through your body in a different way than seeing and, and sort of digitalizing, interpreting the image. So yeah, I think becoming geological in, in, in that is understanding through uh, feeling that which you want to understand. And if you want to understand where is the earth in this um, you know, uh, climatic process, then you might as well become a rock or start perceiving like a rock and um, discover empathy and surpass duality. That, at least this is my, my view on that. Can I answer? Well, at least oh, try an answer. Oh. Or at least try in the question. I want to try a question, actually. Uh, but isn't it more it's not sound, it's more the mode that we, you engage with sound that lets you feel like it's more feeling than the visuality or vision. Yeah, exactly, but you can... It, it, but also, light is also a physical perception, you know? I, I feel light through my eyes and also through my skin. Uh, uh, and it's, I think it's, it's much more about the ways that we have been uh, that our modes of seeing, which have definitely a colonial history, uh, that have been constructed as a, as that distancing sense, because if it, so it, did, it didn't happen to sound, uh, or at least we don't think it did, but the laboratories were full of smells and sounds that were used to subjectify, uh, or, or more, sorry, uh, objectify things, you know. So uh, things also sounded and they would become things to be manipulated because they sounded in a certain way or they smelled in a certain way. Uh, so I think it's very important and this is a, it's, it's not, a, I'm not coming up with this critique, it's a critique that it's very common in the uh, science and technology studies uh, and within the science and technology studies that deal with sound is that we have also to, to improve our, our language towards this essentialism of the division between sound or the opposition between sound and vision. No, I, fully, I fully agree. First of all, because also we've been talking about sound and, um, and vision as two very separate things, whereas uh, you know, we haven't discussed at all audio vision. So, I mean, this is also something I, I wanted to mention. And I, I do agree in the modes of um, perception and the, the modes of discussion of what is vision, because what we are, dis what I think the way we refer to vision here is the idea that, that which generates representation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's not just the, the, the sense of vision, 
because the sense of vision, or, you know, we could even think of something else, as you say, like, you know, eyes are antennas, if you want, mm -hmm. like, light is a, a, a yeah, part of a the electromagnetic yeah. field, and uh, eyes, all antennas, they can receive and emit at the same time, and that's why our eyes very often can can send different signals, <laughs> we, you know. So I, I fully agree. It's, it's the mode that we, the way we interpret. And why? Uh, and that's why I think like practices like Martin and Jamie Pereira, uh, more than showing that uh, uh, sound lets you to have a more emotional connection with the data. More than that, it's more like they present another modality, another way of perceiving the data. And through that, they are creating a large uh, amount of events, of encounters that we are, uh, uh, well, events that we are encountering in different settings, you know. There's like now installations of this kind and uh, exhibitions in uh, uh, bars. There's uh, exhibitions in colleges, in, not only in galleries now. So these things, they are being, uh, they're going out into the streets. And I think it's what it, what what interests me more. It's how they, this widespread practices of different models of representation, of re representing and showing environmental uh, phenomena or problems uh, kind of uh, uh, confront the public. Uh, some microphone is okay, it's gone. So, yeah, this is a kind reminder that we're still at war in the midst of Europe, and we, we are facing with this whole very interesting artistic approaches in how we tackle, how we become geological with this planet, how our art or our production or our research can help into uh, change the current paradigm that we're all facing. Uh, so Adriana was mentioning this uh, highly interesting relationship between science and art, and Jamie was also prompting academia to find out different schemes to tackle the population directly and bring the research here. Martin has already kind of answered uh, this question about uh, his becoming geological. And perhaps we can listen a bit more to Rosemary and to new modes of vision and also to Philippe to see how all this aesthetic research that was presented resonates with him at the scientific level. I think it will be very interesting to close the loop on this session and try to tie it back to turbulence. So. Uh, uh, so briefly, yeah, this was a bit <laughs> complex, turbulent. but yeah. it's turbulent. Yeah, we it we we had the, the opening of the war, so uh, I I guess this sets a nice tone in order to sum up a bit and and to establish like interesting pinpoint new directions of research and perhaps start with Rosemary as future modes of being or seeing or how do you think that. The, tackle these issues conceptually can like change a bit like Jamie was also proposing at an inner level and to tackle how do you see this kind of r relationships um, I, I feel like maybe maybe connecting it back to as you said the, uh, turbulence in the first the first presentation um, maybe where I can connect there is connect you know quite a lot of these thoughts hopefully. Um, is thinking about that there's always some form of interpretation going on in these, these processes and we can intervene and maybe measure something, but you know our measurements will always be kind of limited to our imagination and our tools and, and then also translating this to our perceptual apparatus that um, 
you know, we're kind of caught in between like the real and our perception of it and then there's you know technology somewhere in the midst and then the mediation of these things um, and this leaves a lot of leeway to uh, in what gets conveyed um, and I think I think it was interesting um, what Philip said uh, about his own work is that there, there's you know, it's it, it's science, but it's imperfect, and it's mm -hmm. it's uh, it's under development, and it's you know we can we can understand you know small uh, things about the world, but it's always kind of uh, limited in scope or scale or um, or to our understanding of of, of it, um, and I think. Where I've I've been quite curious digging into this in terms of uh, artistic use of of very advanced forms of uh, visual technology because very often actually what's what's more interesting about these these visual technologies is the stories that we tell about them and like when we get into these very high level data processes it's. Uh, we don't have the level of trained judgment to be able to intuitively understand the outputs of mm -hmm. like very advanced uh, database visualization and and this uh, and so then then you know the common tendency is to kind of call in artists to either kind of communicate and like mm -hmm. kind of create a narrative for or to illustrate and then you know make make pretty pictures of something that can kind exactly. of exactly you know um, it's different it's like whitewashing it's different from the noise emanating that uh, martin for instance tries to derive from the instant data but still it's also an interpretation in my subjective view it's it because it goes through a circuit so there are some medium uh, that it goes through and that process is entirely controlled by the artist yeah, uh, and perhaps would be great before we go to flip to see what uh, jamie thinks on these ideas about the sound as you were mentioning uh, rosemary now was proposing a new interaction new techniques to our vision modes and how how this can interfere a bit with, with all that we are talking about. Also, of course, Jamie, your talk was about uh, deep listening sound into tackling these issues. I don't know if you have like a closing remark or a comment that you like to uh, leave here to the audience. Okay. <coughs> well, um, I think, I, think I, I really love um, the phrase becoming geological. And so it resonates with um, what I've been finding from um, this practice of using, uh, well, almost using uh, indigenous knowledge as a way of informing the listening experience. Um, so I don't think you can do deep listening without um, at least some sort of awareness of uh, the way ways to listen um, and you know I've been I've sort of been making music for most of my life and um, uh, it was only recently that my practice kind of like forced me to engage with um, lots of different schools of thought with um, uh, which which influenced the way I perceive things so, so I feel like that's our um, challenge and actually our pleasure because um, uh, as I sort of demonstrated in, in the talk, you know, if, if, one, um, if one challenge to our perception from um, one part of uh, uh, a native um, First Nation language can bring so much joy and, um, and a new kind of reality to not just listening, listening experience, but our relation to uh, our environment, um I'm, I'm incredibly uh excited to see what what else happens um and it and it ties into um i suppose um 
not just the relationship with our environment, but um, the, our relationship with each other. You know, uh, people, people sometimes ask questions to me about, um, you know, what, what are my viewpoints on climate change? Um, and I, I tend to turn to, well, I tend to push the question back and say that it's not so much about climate change anymore. Um, it's more about um, human change. You know, how do we change as humans in order to um, mitigate the effects that are going to happen from a runaway relationship with the planet? So I hope that covers all things. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. That was uh, becoming geological. Very nice ending. <laughs> And Philip, what do you think uh, about this all aesthetics, also turbulent in your mathematical medium? Uh, well, maybe I can pick up from uh, from Jamie's talk. I, I quite liked the uh, the analogy he made between the death of the environment and the death of a loved one. Uh, one being a linear process and another one being a non-linear one. And uh, one concern I have is that uh, the death of the environment happens over a much larger time scale. Uh, than the death of a loved one, which is a, an immediate uh, event. And so uh, as a nonlinear uh, phenomenon, uh, sometimes uh, pushing in the direction that we want to go can produce uh, opposite effects. And uh, if you allow me to go uh, back into the field of turbulence, one, one classical example we have is the uh, golf ball. So the reason why golf balls have dimples is because actually uh, promoting uh, nonlinearity in the problem makes them fl fly further. So it's something that's counterintuitive. You, you create something which seems like it would have more resistance to the air instead of having a smooth ball, but it actually flies, flies further due to the nonlinearity. And so a concern I've been having is that uh, if we push too hard uh, for immediate social change, it might create uh, some backlashes uh, which with very undesirable effects. And, and we've seen this uh, in, in politics, for example, I, I wonder a bit if uh, if this is a concern that also uh, the other members of the panel share, um, that uh, sometimes to achieve the goal that we want, uh, the straight line is not the direct, the most direct line. Um, and I think part of the problem or where the turbulence comes in is that we don't really know uh, what line to take to get to the destination uh, the fastest. Um, and then perhaps I can, I can um, link a bit to uh, Rosemary's uh, talk and to what uh, Howard was talking about. Uh, I quite liked uh, Howard's idea of uh, allowing a physical phenomenon to express itself and, and uh, visualize it and uh, extract meaning out of it. Uh, I think ideally all science would be uh, made like that. We would observe the phenomenon without interfering with it. Uh, and unfortunately, there are things that we cannot really um, probe without interfering. And that's actually quite, uh, quite a big concern because we never really know if, uh, if the data we are getting is a consequence of the measurement technique or is a consequence of the phenomenon itself. Uh, and my feeling is that there's been lately a push, uh, and this maybe links a bit to, to uh, Rosemary's talk, a push to incorporate uh, uh, automated methods, machine learning, uh, AI, which, uh, which may end up re removing the human component uh, of the measurement. Uh, but then the question I have is, uh, how do we know that the answer we are getting from the algorithm uh, is actually reality and is not just a byproduct of the algorithm itself. Uh, so somehow I think the the, the human component uh, is essential uh, in, in when we interact with the medium, um, and that uh, perhaps using the uh, hypocritical self-aware uh, wording that uh, Jamie introduced, uh, we have to be hypocrites as scientists. We have to know that we are interfering with the medium, and we have to be self-aware. Uh, as we make measurements, and uh, perhaps uh, you know, it's a it's a complex uh, co complex world we live in. It's impossible to take into account all the data, uh, but removing the human element, I think, will be a reason for big concern uh, going into the future. Thank you. I think it was a beautiful ending to this session. Let's see if we have some more questions. Okay, Adriana is here eager to talk, so I'll just pass the mic. Just a closing se uh, sentence. It's not really a question. It's a, it's a, a personal thought. <laughs> um, first, uh, well, I think that, uh, and somebody, <laughs> yeah, in 
I think that you all were mentioning in one way or the other this myth of uh, objectivity. Uh, uh, algorithms are made by humans, of course. <laughs> no, so when we're talking about AI, just because we don't know the results doesn't mean that it's not intervention. And I really, um, I wonder, and this is a question that is not requiring an answer right here, um, is this, uh, once artistic processes are uh, in, why, in one way or the other all about exploring ambivalences and overcoming in one way or the other these dichotomies, uh, could it be that actually this artistic making, this uh, wanting, yes, on the one hand to represent something uh, and even making people aware of it, on the other hand, uh, wanting to explore perceptual experience in itself. I wonder if this is maybe not a good, uh, solution, a proposal, <laughs> you know, to address these things, no? Because um, when I was looking at your model, Philippe, I was thinking, okay, this is so pretty, you know, uh, it, could, it could probably be done in not such a delightful way, um, so visually uh, pleasant, uh, maybe this uh, pleasure or this aesthetics are actually a way of um, making us self-aware of things, you know, including the, the noisy, chaotic expression of the mushrooms. <laughs> I wonder, though. <laughs> okay, thank you all.